Hi there. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tinnitus TV. Today, I am talking to Kevin Hearn. You might not be surprised to learn that Hearn hearts the 80s, but he definitely does it in a way that you don't expect. On the Bare Naked Ladies Utility Player's latest extracurricular album, Dreaming of the 80s, a collaborative effort with violinist Hugh Marsh, Hearn reimagines a diverse slate of me-decade musical gems from artists like Tom Petty, Joy Division, Psychedelic Furs, Billy Idol, Tom Waits, Bob Marley, Sun Ra, and more, including his old boss and musical mentor, Lou Reed. But instead of recreating these songs in all their pastel-colored, shoulder-padded glory, the Canadian duo take a more nuanced and idiosyncratic approach, deconstructing and reassembling them into moody, ethereal, and, yes, dreamy synth pop fare. The day before the album was released, Hearn zoomed in from his Toronto digs to talk about life with Lou, future dreams, his teenage basement tapes, and tons more. Enjoy. All right, Kevin Hearn. Well, thanks for taking the time to, to talk to me today. Thanks for having me on. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, we are here, of course, to talk about your new album with Hugh Marsh, Dreaming of the 80s. And uh, I, I want to start by giving you my compliments on this thing, because, you know, a lot of times covers albums, they kind of feel, I don't know, thrown together or tossed off or kind of, you, you know, insubstantial, maybe. Um, this one not the case this is this is really beautiful and 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 unique and and it really feels like a labor of love well thank you for that um i'm glad that comes across it was a labor of love uh it was a you know we did dig in to each song that we we chose uh tried to reinvent it a little yes. and create it in more of a, a a dreamy way perhaps but it was it was during the pandemic, and it was our way of staying creative uh, at a time when I found it difficult to sort of write original material. Um, and it was sort of a way of rediscovering songs from when I grew up and and doing something creative that didn't have that uh, layer of um, pressure on it, if you know what I mean. Sure. I, and I can understand why the eighties would sort of be your go to. I mean, given your age, I presume it's sort of, you know, the decade of your musical coming of age, as it were. But but Hugh's older than than you, right? So I don't think it's necessarily his uh, decade. So how did you kind of did you did you arm wrestle him for it or, or how did you decide to settle on the 80s? Well, we did a uh, show at Fogo Island Inn for their New Year's Eve event in 2019. And because we knew there would be people coming from all over the place for the event, we decided to do a few covers during our set. And we did a few things that weren't 80s, like we did a Burt Yanch song and mm -hmm. a couple other things. But there were, you know, we did Heaven by the Psychedelic Furs and Rooftop Garden by Lou Reed and Cemetery Polka by Tom Waits. And when we got back to Toronto, I said, why don't we go into the studio while we still have those in our... Uh, system and just lay them down and so we did but and at that point we weren't making a record we were just doing it to do it and uh have it sort of there for for whatever purpose um and then the pandemic hit and then it was like let's keep going and let's let's look at more songs from the 80s but Hugh was very particular like he's very picky and I suggested a Duran Duran song, The Chauffeur, and he said, uh-uh, no. <laughs> and uh, I suggested something by Roxy Music, and he said, no. Uh, so well, why not? What 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 was what about them that that he was vetoing? <laughs> I, I think with Duran Duran, he just they don't resonate with him. Their music doesn't resonate. Um with with uh, Roxy Music, I think he had a personal experience with Brian Ferry that uh, he didn't want to. <laughs> you know, do any of their music. Um, and he was one of those guys, he's been all over the place and played with so many people. He's, he has so many stories. But yeah, when I suggested Roxy Music or Brian Ferry, he just said, no way. And uh, so I said, well, you choose one, you know, and I thought he would choose something, you know, sort of off the beaten path and experimental, but he chose Free Falling by uh, Tom Petty. Okay. 
which I wouldn't have touched with a 10 foot pole, but, you know, we did our best and we had uh, Fernando Saunders from Lou Reed's band joined us on vocals and bass guitar. And uh, I think we turned it into something pretty cool. Oh, definitely. I mean, and that, that is one of the, I'd say probably maybe the most high profile Well, that and the joy division one, I think are kind of the two biggest hits, if you want to say in terms of the set list. Um, but a lot of these things are are kind of unpredictable, a uh, deep divey. I mean, you know, you're you're not picking artists that people would sort of expect or or think of in terms of the '80s. I mean, there's no, uh, as you mentioned, there's no Duran Duran, no Roxy, no Michael Jackson or Madonna or a whole bunch of other names that would sort of be right at the top of your mind. You guys are picking, uh, you know. Um, more esoteric say maybe perhaps a little you know lesser known artists and then not even going for their hits you're going for like you know album tracks off of one of their lesser known albums i mean this is really you know layers and layers and layers you're going into here uh was there a lot of you going and pulling out albums and and listening to stuff or was this were these things that you'd kind of always wanted to cover how did you come up with these particular songs in a lot of cases some of them are songs I've loved since I was a kid. Uh, during the pandemic, I started posting once a week. I'd pick a song and play it on the piano. And, uh, you know, just to sort of stay connected with folks. And so that turned into an exercise of like going through my collection and, oh, remember this song and, oh, this would be fun to do. And so I was sort of just in that mindset. And uh having Hugh come over and we would sort of make a list of songs and listen to records and uh, make a little short list. We still have a list of ones we didn't do, but uh, these are the ones we did. Yeah. Were there, uh, were there some that you tried that, that you couldn't make work? Uh, we were working on a song by Beverly Glenn Copeland, the, uh, the Canadian composer. Yeah. Um, and we were working on it and then we kind of realized, you know, I think we have enough songs now. I think we're, we're now going, you know, too far and we should, we should focus on what we have, okay. but I'm sort of, sort of sad we didn't get it done because it's a beautiful piece. And uh, maybe for, if we do any more, we'll, we'll do, start with that one. All right. Well, let's talk about a few of these songs. I mean, I, I think it was, I, I thought it was really nice that you started off with Lou Reed's Rooftop Garden. Obviously, it uh, feels like a kind of a personal, you know, thing for you. Absolutely. Um, I mean, how do you pick one Lou Reed song? Oh, exactly. But uh, that song sort of resonates with me because it's the last song on his record, Legendary Hearts. And on my first tour with Lou, we were invited to an after show party at the promoter's house. I believe it was London, England. And uh, we were on the roof. The party was on the roof. And so we're looking out and I, I started singing to Lou, um, sitting in our rooftop garden, looking down below. And he looked at me and said, Kevin, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say that would take some balls to do that in Lou Reed's presence. It would, and and every time you made a joke to Lou, it was it was a risk. <laughs> I would imagine. I mean, what, what was he like to work for? Because I only I only saw him, you know, interviewed and things like that. And he's obviously a guy who suffered no fools, mm -hmm. and I would think he might be a, a tough boss. He was. It wasn't an easy gig, but he treated me with. Uh, respect and uh, he treated me like a son you know he was always he was never mean to me and uh, I, I'd seen him snap at journalists and I, I wouldn't want to deal with that side but uh, he was never like that with me he was always kind and treated me like a friend and a son cool um, also on this uh, you mentioned doing doing Tom Waits Cemetery Polka congratulations on on finding a way to make Tom Waits sound even quirkier uh, than than normal this feels like kind of a an outtake from Cabaret or something yeah um, that's my old friend Michael Colvin singing the lead on that one and he's a, a great opera singer but we went to school together St. Michael's Choir School here in downtown Toronto and he just happened to call me. Uh, I think his son was wanting to go into music and 
he asked if he could come by the studio with his son and sort of just watch us work for a couple hours. And I said, well, if you're going to be here, why don't you sing on this Tom Waits song? And Nobody <laughs> rides for free, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I sent it to him, you know, and he rose to the occasion. And he's amazing. I love Michael. Nice. And, and then and then I was surprised to, uh, or maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, given given your work with uh, Lorana Phipps Ray and the Cosmic Crew, that you did the the, the Sun Ra number on there with yeah. Michael Ray. Yeah, yeah, having Michael Ray sort of be on that track, uh, what an honor, and uh, a guiding light. And my dad reads the poem at the beginning of the the medley, which is written by Sun Ra. And uh, we were going to ask someone else to read it, you know, another artist. But Michael Ray was like, no, is that your dad? No, that's it. It's great. <laughs> so that's my dad. Oh, well, it uh, ties in because it's your dad on the album cover. Yeah. Yeah. It all ended up tying tying in together. Perfect. Did, did you ever see Sun Ra live? You know what? I didn't. He played at a Toronto club. I think it was called The Purple Onion uh, shortly before he passed away. But I was still... Uh, uh, underage and uh i didn't go <laughs> would have been a good one yeah i just finished reading space is the place uh the biography and uh so i was like oh perfect timing you know uh, I, I love shining a light on just the fact that he was working as an artist in the 80s because i think he's a giant uh you know oh, yeah. yeah and um i've seen the orchestra uh, under the direction of Marshall Allen uh, many times since, you know, yeah. but I, I never got to see Sun Ra himself. Have you heard that uh, that Phil Elvin album that they play on? No. Yeah, you should check it out. It's called Unsung Stories, and uh, they back him up on on three or four songs. It's it's very cool. It's a nice combination of of things. Phil Alvin? Yeah, the blaster singer, you know? Okay. Unsung yeah. stories. Okay. Unsung stories. Yeah, it's on uh, Slash, but I'm I'm sure you can find it everywhere online. Okay, and, so and, you're, you're you, a fan of uh, that kind of. You like Sun Ra music. I like everything good. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and how can you not like Sun Ra? I mean that uh, you know Yola Tango's Nuclear War is is. is oh, nuclear. I love their version. Yeah, it's a classic. Yeah, I I was turned on to Sun Ra on Hal Wilner's um, record that he did. It was all music of the Walt Disney. Disney. Yeah. yeah. So I was still in high school, but hearing uh, Pink Elephants on Parade by Sun Ra, it's like, yeah. So when I worked with Lou, I got to know Hal really well and was able to thank him for that, you know, in person, which was nice. Yeah, I talked to I talked to Hal once about something. Oh, I know. He was he was doing something. I think it was a Neil Young tribute at the Grammys one year or something, and, and he was doing that. And yeah, what a fascinating guy. Yeah. He was a true, true music lover, you know, like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One he, of those guys who, 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 yeah, as you say, just, just was in it for all the right reasons and just loved everything and, and had this way of putting together people and finding these, these great, uh, these great ways of, of creating something wonderful in his job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you do Kate Bush, but you, you, you picked the wrong Kate Bush song for 2023, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> apparently yeah <laughs> i mean we recorded that long before uh that that song was featured on the show um yeah we did watching you without me i just always loved that song so but no canadians uh i mean you said you were working on the beverly glenn copeland but but no canadian uh songs on here what's what's the deal man I know, I know it's it's not right. Um, but I, I think I want to do another volume featuring Canadians. Oh, yeah. Uh, 80s again? Yeah, I want to do Spoons, uh, Nova Heart. I want to do uh, something Leonard Cohen off of I'm Your Man. So it's, you know, it was really tough. Your to song on there, buddy. OK, <laughs> which one? I don't care. Pick one. I mean, you know, Tom Sawyer, I guess, is probably the classic, but you guys will have to deep dive. Just don't do like, you know, Cygnus X1 or something that's like right. 20 minutes, right? You know, I really like invisible airwaves, crackle with light. I could do the radio. Them. There you go. Yeah, I think it would work. I, okay. I mean, I, I don't know. I have it in my head. Did you work with Rush at some point? I haven't worked with Rush, but uh, I mean, they neil peart was on a no no i was saying did hugh not you hugh oh hugh sorry 
Uh, not that I'm aware of, okay. no. Oh, you know, Alex Lifeson sits in with the Rio Statics now, you know, and Hugh's playing with them, and so do I. So it's all, you know, yeah. Sorry, and, you were going to say something about Neil? Uh, Neil played on a Rio Statics record, Whale Music, and right. Getty inducted the Bare Naked Ladies into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at the Junos a few years ago. So, you know, we, we know those guys a little bit, and um, yeah, they're great. And and I believe if I've got this right, uh, you did have Carol Pope guesting on the Billy Idol uh, Eyes Without a Face, right? Yeah, yeah. Carol and I are friends, and um, we've been working together. I've been working with Rough Trade, playing live with them, and we did a song together called uh, Resist It. So, you know, I asked her if she'd do it, and she did. So you're going to have to do High School Confidential on the Canadian uh, one then, right? Absolutely, yeah. Or uh, Fashion Victim. I really like that one. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, there's so much stuff from the 80s in Canada. It was a incredibly you know rich and productive decade you just so many huge bands and so many so many huge tracks uh you mentioned you mentioned the, the way you approach these songs in terms of reinventing them and kind of making them your own and and that is one of the things i think that really um makes the album great is is, is it kind of exists in its own sonic and stylistic place it doesn't feel like despite the disparity of all these songs and styles and artists and, you know, you kind of bring them all together. How did you achieve that? Is it something that just happened naturally with the two of you playing or were there specific things that you consciously did to kind of create this, this sonic space for it? Well, I think Hugh and I are kindred spirits in a way. And we, we sort of have a zone that we like to, to be, to be in when we play. Um, I don't mean physically, but there's a, a musical environment we like to create. And so right behind me, you can see my piano and the accordion. That's where we made the record, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah, it was just us playing these songs. We would add things after the fact, but uh, for the most part, it was just us uh, getting into, into that mood and playing them. If I could tell one story about... Uh, tell me if I'm jumping ahead here, but about the Bob Marley cover coming in from the cold. Go for it. Um, yeah, that was one that I posted on Instagram, just solo and playing it in a dreamy way. And then we were here on a Tuesday and we we're going to invite Chris Gartner, the bass player over and play it as a trio. And so we thought, why don't we make a demo of it for Chris so he knows what direction we're going and we recorded it once and after we after that we said that was it so what you hear on the record is like the one and only time we played it wow yeah so it was right, though, but i mean then you don't get you don't get demoitis right exactly demoitis <laughs> yeah well that's the truth though i mean they, and i'm sure that's happened to you where you you demo something and then you you try and recreate it in the proper studio and you spend hours and hours and take after take trying to recapture the the same magic that you just you know tossed off the cuff at home yeah and and you could end up you know sucking all the life out of it mm -hmm. exactly yeah. um so you know i think by anybody's estimation you have a really good gig with the ladies uh you know you're, you're wildly successful beloved um, creatively satisfied, I would think. And, and, and for a lot of people, that would be more than enough to keep them happy. Um, but you, sir, I put it to you, I accuse you, Kevin Hearn, you are a serial collaborator. You seem to always <laughs> be wanting to do something else. Are you just um, somebody with a short attention span or what's the deal? Um... I love I love music, you know, and I and I feel like I always have ideas and a little list of things I want to do, and I just keep doing them. And I think that, um, you know, I'm a cancer survivor, so after that experience, I was very much in the mindset of you got to do these things when you can. And so I'm always trying to explore and grow and 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 do these do them. Makes sense. I mean, I remember talking to Roseanne Cash uh, years and years ago after she had had brain surgery. She had a tumor. And I, and I asked her, how did that 
change you? And she said, well, you know, I just stopped giving a fuck about what anybody else thought about anything. And I just do what I want to do when I want to do it. Is that a similar kind of experience for you? Yeah, it rings a bell. Uh -huh. I can totally relate. And I love working with other people because you learn and you grow and you bring that knowledge and experience to other projects. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do do most of these collaborations, are they people who seek you out or or people you seek out? Or is it somebody you happen to meet and go, hey, you know what? What are you doing tomorrow? Let's let's do something. How does it generally work for you? Um. If I do meet someone and I feel like we, re you know, hit it off and, you know, I would consider it. I wonder if we could collaborate and I would reach out and, um, you know, like with Michael Ray from the Sun Ra Orchestra, uh, we were doing, I was working on a medley of superhero songs and I thought, you know, Michael Ray singing Wonder Woman, that would be amazing. <laughs> so I, I had the idea. And it's the only time that sentence has been spoken in the history of the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against Michael Ray. I'm just saying it doesn't come up that often, you know? Yeah, I, I, I agree. <laughs> so I reached out to him and said, hey, I met you briefly after a Sun Ra orchestra show. I'm working on this medley. Would you consider singing on it? And so he wrote back and said, send it to me. And I sent him the medley and I said, Wonder Woman is like, 215 to three you know whatever it was a minute long so he wrote back and he said i love this medley i want to play trumpet on the whole thing okay. i'm like okay wonderful <laughs> you know <laughs> so and then there's been other times like i reached out to a fellow from the fleetwoods uh because i thought i love his voice i wonder if he'd sing on something and he wrote back and said no, I am not interested. And the Fleetwoods broke up, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, forget it. So you never know. Uh -huh. But you never know, you know, uh, unless you try. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. so do you have, I mean, you mentioned having kind of a list of, of, of things. Um, are you constantly sort of flitting from from one thing to the other? Or do you get an idea and kind of chase it down and finish it off and 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 be done with it um i try to but some things just take time you know so it's i always think of it as like a stove and there's different pots on the stove and some of them are on um minimum and, and some of them are totally in my focus and that's sort of how i do it so how many burners are, are going <laughs> as we speak i got four burners going daryl <laughs> <laughs> gas we're cooking with gas, cooking with gas. <laughs> and i mean i guess it helps too i mean in that you know if you've got a lot of things that are sort of in progress or you know you you can start on one and then when you maybe hit a wall or you know get bored or or you know whatever you can then move on to something else right it, it's so you can always be coming at something with a with a fresh perspective and a fresh pair of ears and a new idea might pop up and all that yeah and sometimes I like to take time to listen to how things are are going and you know after a few listens I go you know what that that cello line just doesn't need to be there mm. you know that do you throw a lot of stuff away or or do, do you rework a lot of stuff um do you mean within one song or just in general either way uh you know, I used to pile so much stuff in songs and I'm learning to, to, to take things out. You know, I think it was Brian Eno who said, like, if it's not actually doing something, just get it out of there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Sun Ra, of course, who says space is the place. So I think as Miles I'm, Davis, it's the notes you don't play, right? Exactly. So, yeah, as I get older, it's uh, it's so easy working in the digital recording realm to just add things in and take them out so you have to sort of learn how to do that and make sure you take things out I think well it's also it, I mean it, it I always um wonder as a as as a an artist a writer whatever composer however you want to think of yourself when do you know that something is done you know uh I I think when you when it gives you that feeling 
it makes you dance, you know, uh, not physically, but just emotionally. Uh, it's like when you go to an art gallery and you're drawn to a painting and you don't really know why it's just, it just something about it makes you dance, you know? And, uh, I, I, I feel that way about songs, you know, and I think like we were talking about before, you can try and try and redo things and get it right. And you end up ruining it. So right. you gotta, you gotta be conscious of when it's time to let go. Yeah. And I mean, there's always that compulsion, that one more thing, you know, oh, maybe a tambourine, yeah. you know, let's, let's get some sleigh bells on there or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, it reminds me of, uh, uh, well, Elmore Leonard, you know, the the the, the crime novelist who said, uh, I was interviewing him once and, and he was talking about, you know, when I was a young man, I used to write these long, elaborate things about, uh, you know, a guy would come in and this would happen and that would happen and this would happen. And then nowadays I just write and he walked in and then he shot him, <laughs> you know, which is, I think it's a sort of similar approach, like get in, get to the point, get out, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so talking about about collaborations and projects and all these various things, is, is there kind of a, a a dream project or a dream collaboration for you that that you've yet to achieve? Honestly, Lou Reed was my dream. Can't can't, can't beat that, huh? Yeah. yeah. If I could, I'd give anything to just hang with him again, and you know, yeah. Were Were you a fan of his when you were growing up? I was. I had this uh, photo in my my locker all through my years in high school. <laughs> Can <Yeah>. I go on? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I knew all of his songs, and he knew that. He liked that. When I auditioned for him, I, I started playing a song from Mistrial called uh, I Remember You. And he stopped me and said, Kevin, no one knows that song except you, me, and Seven Seagulls. <laughs> <laughs> seven seagulls seven seagulls yeah <laughs> is, is miss trial your favorite lou reed or do you have a favorite lou reed it's it's impossible to pick but yeah. i love uh i love i love the gentle songs like sunday morning pale blue eyes mm -hmm. uh there's one from late in his career called baton rouge that i think is a tour de force lyrically that um those those are three of my favorites. Nice, nice. So, do you want to tell me about any of these other uh, plots on the burner? Oh, uh, <laughs> sure. Well, we're writing for a new BNL record right now. Um, the project I'm uh, really excited about right now is um, through the pandemic. I took I had this weird high school band, and we never went out. We always spent our weekends in the basement with our little home studio synthesizers a four track machine and we made all these strange songs and we were all classically trained so they were very interesting and weird but i finally took all the cassettes put them into pro tools and got together with my old bandmate anthony brown and we've dusted them off and reinvented some of them and i've got about two records worth of really interesting music that I'm hopefully going to put out. The basement tapes. Yeah, our own little basement tapes, yeah. Is Anthony uh, still a musician or has he gone on to a different life? Uh, he still plays music, but not professionally. Right. Yeah. So, so I mean, is this a thing where you're going to get the band back together and do some dates maybe? <laughs> Anything's possible, I think. I <laughs> doubt it, but I right. think that's, you know we weren't really a live kind of band we were all introverts you know no yeah <laughs> <laughs> so but i'd be uh, i'd be excited to see what people think of this this material i i think it's terrific i think it was ahead of its time if i don't say so myself are you doing a lot of tweaking or is it just kind of cleaning up the sonics well, some of them, we we only had two tracks, um, so we were just cleaning them, but some of them were four tracks and we were able to go in and, you know, maybe add a cooler drum loop or uh, isolate the vocal and, you know, that sort of thing. So some of them had major surgery and some of them were as is. Very cool. So is it is it pop rock or how would you? Uh, I would say it's like synth, synth rock. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so 
indulging your OMD uh, fascination? Absolutely. Yeah, it's all like mostly drum machines and uh, monopoly synth, poly six. Yeah. And okay. songs like uh, Space Pirates and Billy Joe Bob's Got a Cadillac, um, <laughs> Buying an Organ. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, okay. That's got to come out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, it's high school kids and we weren't in the business. We were just making music because we loved it, you know, and yeah. we found it fun. So we, you know, we'd smoke a joint and make a weird song. <laughs> exactly. What more yeah. do you need? Exactly. Uh, well, listen, I'll, 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 I'll let you go after I tell you one, one quick little story. It's 2009 and, and the Juno Awards are in Vancouver and uh -huh. the Warner After Party is at Brian Adams uh, Warehouse Studio. And they have a stage there with gear on it. And you get up on stage with a few people. And I figure, okay, well, he's going to do, you know, something uh, in the realm of, of what I would expect from him. And you, do you remember what you played? I don't even remember that party. <laughs> well, you you start playing it and, and it's... Da -da, ch -ch 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 -ch. Oh. Da -da, and you just blast out war pigs at like full volume. <laughs> War and that was when I went, this this Kevin Hearn guy, there's more to him than meets the eye. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were there. That, that song, yeah, I love that song. Uh, someday there has to be a dreaming of the 70s. Okay, <laughs> and War Pigs will be on there. Yes, I, I mean, I think you've got a whole franchise now. You can just, you know. Well. I, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I get boring pretty fast, I imagine. Yeah, this one was for fun, you know, and maybe we'll do another one. But uh, yeah, it was a fun trip to go on. I kind of see it as like a Alice in Wonderland. You go start the record and then you meet a lot of interesting characters along the way, like Michael Ray and Brian Ritchie from the Femmes and Carol Pope and my friend Michael Colvin and it's just a cast of interesting musicians and characters. Which one is Brian Ritchie on? He's on the Vine, uh, he's on the Sun Ra medley. Oh, he is. Okay, I didn't know that. Well, that must have been fun for you because you're you're a, you you love the Femmes, right? Oh yeah, I love them. Yeah, cool. Brian's a bit of a mentor to me uh, these days, and uh, yeah, he plays the the flute. The what's it called? The Japanese flute, the sakuhachi. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, no. sakuhachi flute. Wow. And he plays bass and sings. Nice. Yeah. All right, sir. Well, listen, thanks so much for this album and, and thanks for your time today. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was nice to talk to you. Thank you. All right. See you down the road somewhere. Okay. Okay. Bye.